Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Russia says it's abandoning the most significant Ukrainian city it's captured. Is this a game changer or perhaps a bluff? What clever plan have the Russians got in mind? They are masters of Maskarovka, deception. Have they got something in mind which they want to spring upon the Ukrainians? Professor of Defence Studies Michael Clark will once again explain all. We'll also assess whether political tremors in America threaten military support to Ukraine and hear how British troops are training ordinary Ukrainians to defend themselves and their country. Many of them were, up until about 10 days or two weeks before getting here, were, were butchers, they were lawyers, they were doctors. And what I expect to see is 200 people leaving with the skills that they need to survive, fight and win against Russia. And the sale of Twitter to Elon Musk has not only sent some tweeters into collective meltdown, it's also brought calls for a national security review. But does Twitter really matter? It's hugely important. Twitter has become very much part of the, the military communication strategy, but also in terms of intelligence gathering as well. During Russia's massive overnight invasion of Ukraine, its forces only managed to capture one regional capital. After holding Kherson since February, they've announced a retreat from the city. Russia's commander in Ukraine, General Sergei Surovakin, called it a difficult decision as he announced the withdrawal on state TV, talking to the Kremlin's defense minister. It looks like a significant blow for Russia, but Ukraine Ukraine's president has responded cautiously, saying the enemy does not give out gifts or make goodwill gestures. Uh, Michael Clark, you've told us many times that Kherson is strategically important for Russia as the gateway to occupy Crimea. So how just how big is this? Yes, Kate, it's very big in symbolic terms, of course, because as we keep saying, this is the one city, regional city that the Russians did take in February this year. And so they, they, they are now apparently withdrawing from their one prize, as it were. But it's also, it's the, it's the center of the Kherson Oblast. It dominates the, uh, the great Dnipro River. Uh, that splits Ukraine into two, you know, one third in the east and two thirds in the west. And it has a big bearing on what happens in Crimea because it provides part of the water supply to Crimea just north of Kherson. Um, and a lot of the land routes into Crimea go through Kherson. So to lose the city is a big symbolic loss, but it's also quite a big logistical loss for the Russians who are digging in, all the signs are they're digging in on the eastern side of the Dnipro River and that they intend to winter, spend the winter on the other side of the river until something changes in a, a big offensive in the spring. So what does happen now? Can Ukrainian forces just march into Kherson? Well, they're not going to because they're not sure what the Russians have left behind. There'll be lots of booby traps, lots of mines, M may well be a lot of spetsnats, Russian special forces dressed as civilians who will try to create an urban conflict. And the uh, Russian film crews have moved into Kherson this week as if they intend to film whatever's going to happen next. So the Ukraine is going to be very, very careful. And what they want to do is just probe gently, probe carefully towards Kherson. And I think personally that they will stay outside Kherson unless they're really sure and move more to Novokokovka, a bit further northwest, which is the key to what's going to happen next in this battle. That's my guess. We should just address one possibility here, that it's a bluff by Russia to lure Ukrainian troops in. They did, after all, say they were pulling back from Ukraine's borders just days before the invasion. Yes, and, you know, they set up these charming little uh, vignettes for us, as they did yesterday with Sorovakin speaking to Shogu, the defence minister. I, when I was watching it, I was thinking, oh, I bet there's meetings like that in the MOD, you know, <laughs> where, where, the, where the chief of the defence staff, Tony Radikin, goes into Ben Wallace and shows him a map and says, I think we should withdraw from from NATO and Ben Wallace says, yes, I think we should. Probably a good idea. <laughs> I, it was just, it was a charming little scene. And I bet Sorovakin and Shoga were, were absolutely delighted to be told to take part in it. It really made me laugh to watch it. You know, if it's a trap, the Ukrainians are not going to fall into it. I, I don't really think it's a trap. I think that little charming vignette was for the sake of Russian publics to make it clear that this is a military decision, not Putin's decision. Remember, Putin will, will not take responsibility for this. And that's what that was all about, making it clear that he wasn't there, but the military was.
Mm. When you say that uh, the objective may well be to cause uh, unrest in Kherson by putting uh, people in plain clothes uh, from the Russian side of things, uh, what is the ex- exact objective there? Do you think is it just to complete have c- complete anarchy there? I think yes. The, uh, I mean, the Russians are giving up the city, and if they can create an image that the Ukrainians are actually shooting other Ukrainians, that the Ukrainians are invading a city that really wants to be Russian, that's what they would like to create. And the other, the problem with this for the Ukrainians, and it is a, it's a, it's this is a great victory for them. And it's a very delicate moment, because the, if the Russians sit the other side of the river. They can bombard the city. I mean, they've, they've got no conscience about reducing cities to rubble, as we've seen. The Ukrainians have got to get the Russians another 30 kilometers east. They've got to push them away from the Dnipro River on the eastern side, where the Russians are presently digging in. They've got lots of fortifications. They've delivered all these concrete bunkers, which are almost like uh, public loos, but concrete. And, they, and they're there every few hundred meters all the way along the river. So the Ukrainians have got to try to push them back from that. Now, they will not do that by crossing the river. Somehow they've got to... We've got to encircle them from the north, which is why I'm keeping an eye on Novokovka, or launch another prong of the offensive, which they probably can, from Zaporizhia, and actually come come in at the Russian troops who are sitting along the river from the north to outflank them and force them to withdraw. And only when the Russian troops are 30 or 40, 40 kilometres further east than Kherson will Kherson be safe from Russia's artillery bombardments. And clearly getting Kherson back is strategically important to Ukraine as a final war aim. But is it a game changer in the war? Does it give them a new advantage in the fight or is it just more territory to defend? Well, it's a potential game changer in the in the ground war because it raises the real possibility that the Russians may lose their land bridge to Crimea. I mean, already they, they're not going to make it to Odessa. They're not made it to Mykolaiv. They, they've not been able to landlock um, Ukraine. And this is decisive in that respect. And it may well be the stepping stone to the sort of offensive that I've just talked about. Is it a turning point in the war? No, because the war will go on fairly indefinitely. Whatever happens on the ground, however much territory the Russians lose, Putin, as long as he's in the Kremlin, will keep this war going by air attack against Ukraine, against Ukrainian civilians and Ukrainians' critical national infrastructure. So in one sense, he wants to get through the winter with some territory still intact while he just bombards Ukrainian society. And that's the way the war is going to go, sadly, for the next few months into next year. Well, Kherson may be a key battle victory for Ukraine, but as Mike just said, it's still far from victory in the war, and that requires continued support from the UK and other NATO nations. For example, the defence think tank Rusi has warned Ukraine is in danger of running out of air defence munitions. Without them, Russia would have a much easier route to retaking territory, and the UK has just announced it's almost finished supplying another 1,000 missiles to take down Russian drones and cruise missiles. But Britain Britain's help is not just in hardware, it's also training Ukrainian forces here in the UK, including very rapid turnaround for new recruits. The Defence Secretary has been watching it in action and James Wharton was there for SITREP. Soldiers undergoing training. In platoon-sized groups, they practice storming enemy positions. Watching closely on, their instructors stepping in to advise on their tactics and their methods. But these aren't British recruits, they're Ukrainian, and they have just five weeks to get it right. Since June, the British Army, with the help of international colleagues, has overseen the training of some 7,000 Ukrainians across four sites in the UK. The recruits are flown in, kitted out with everything a soldier needs, and put through their paces in a condensed version of what would ordinarily take a British soldier six months to achieve. At the end, they go home to Ukraine and they fight. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace is visiting the training troops. We're at a secret location somewhere in the north of England. We're not in it for a sort of calculated win-loss. We're in it because what Russia is doing is challenging our values, the human rights, the rule of law, the international rule of law, and the very concept of sovereignty of a country. So we're in it to help Ukraine until they are successful. Uh, and we're, you know, that support is enduring, that, that we are there, whether it's the, the software of how to do things, which is what you see here, effectively, the training, or whether it's hardware, or whether it's just defence reform within Ukraine to make sure that they can see through the winter and see into the long term. We'll be there standing by them shoulder to shoulder. British Army personnel are also providing training for junior commanders 
for what would typically be aimed at developing the battlefield leadership skills required by effective junior non-commissioned officers. But who are these new soldiers and what walks of life have the recruits come from? Lieutenant Colonel John Harris is overseeing the training. He's taken the guys from raw recruits to battle-ready soldiers. Many of them were, up until about 10 days or two weeks before getting here, were, were butchers, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they were internet analysts, all sorts of walks of life. So they come here, spend five weeks with us, and what I expect to see at the end of the training is, is, is 200 people leaving with the skills that they need to survive, fight and win against Russia when they return to Ukraine. But what I'm hoping they get from here is I hope they're getting some respite from the battlefield in Ukraine in the margins of some, some really demanding training. Ben Wallace says there's benefits to British troops delivering the training too. Some of their very senior leaders started their lives in a Russian or a Soviet army uh, and so they, they are learning how we do things, but also they're now bringing their own experience from the battlefield. You know, we, we shouldn't forget that 18,000 Ukrainians have lost their lives since 2014. To them, they've been at war ever since then. I've met today some platoon commanders who've been out in the battlefield. They're bringing their skills, and that's helping us as well. That's helping us modernize. So there's a mutual benefit here, but also we're taking really raw recruits who literally get off the plane in a tracksuit, giving them a uniform, taking them through the basic training, straight into skills, and some of them will go straight to the battlefield. With not an hour wasted, very soon these soldiers will be in the thick of action, protecting their country from the invading Russian troops, fighting for their families, friends and countrymen. It will be the skills learned here, tactics and doctrine used by NATO, that may save their lives. James Wharton reporting. The UK's commitment of more than £2 billion a year of military assistance for Ukraine is dwarfed by the US. It's already delivered nearly $17 billion worth. But is the future of that American military assistance now at risk after US midterm elections? Certifying the results will take weeks, but it looks like the Republicans have seized control of the House of Representatives, making it much harder for President Biden to do what he wants. During the campaign, the most senior Republican in the House said there would be no blank check for Ukraine. And this is what Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene told a Save America rally. Under Republicans, not another penny will go to Ukraine. Our country comes first. Now, that's probably not the majority view among Republicans, but it still raises the possibility of Ukraine becoming a pawn in America's domestic political battles. Well, let's bring in Dr. Jonathan Monton, Associate Professor in Political Science at UCL. Uh, good to speak to you, Jonathan. Just start by shedding some more light for us on how the US system works. The House of Representatives is the lower house of Congress. What power does it have to stand in the way of President Biden? Uh, thank you. Um, it has the power over appropriations. It has the power to block appropriating new money for military aid to Ukraine, um, should it choose to use that power. And how likely do you think that is to transpire? Well, that is a very interesting question. So far, there's been pretty strong bipartisan support um, amongst both parties for military aid to Ukraine in Congress. There have been some dissenting voices, I think, on both sides within both parties, but uh, much stronger on the Republican side. But I think the Republican Party is, is divided on this question. There continues to be a very strong faction within the Republican Party that is in favor of backing Ukraine unconditionally to defeat and contain um, Russia. Um, on the other hand, there is a growing movement I think stronger within the uh, America first Trump base that is appears to be increasingly hostile to military aid to Ukraine, but they are they are not a majority within the Republican Party. And I think it would be very unlikely that they could actually carry a vote over um, either su substantially limiting or cutting off aid to Ukraine. Michael Clark, the argument from some Republicans is that the US is putting in about 70% of the military assistance pledged to Ukraine. And this is on Europe's doorstep, not America's. Europe isn't pulling its weight here. Is that fair? 
Well, it's certainly true in uh, monetary terms, <clears throat> and some of the European contributions are tiny. Against that, the Europeans would say, look, you know, the European sanctions are pretty important against Russia, and also that Europe is much more vulnerable on oil and gas. And actually, the, the news on that has been much better in recent months. I mean, Europe will, probably will get through the winter, even a cold winter now, because gas reserves are very high. Uh, Europe will be out of buying Russian oil pretty quickly after next year. So, the, you know, Russia's long-term market in Europe has now basically collapsed and so the Europeans would say look you know, it's not all about money but the fact is the Republicans are absolutely right I mean this is much more our crisis than America's crisis and as usual the Europeans are relying on America to provide the lead. Well, let's look at a bit further forward to two years time and another presidential election. I'm going to be making a very big announcement on Tuesday, November 15th. Donald Trump clearly wants us to think he's going to run for president again. Dr. Monson, if he does, will that bolster his America first ethos in the Republican Party, potentially to the detriment of support for Ukraine? Yeah, absolutely. It could. I think Trump himself is a very unpredictable figure um, in all this. He wants to be seen as leading this America first movement. But on the other hand, he wants to be seen as a sort of tough and respected global leader. So I think he would be torn. I, I think he would be conflicted. You, you could see him, yeah, pu pull the plug on aid in the way he did, for example, on U.S. military aid and involvement in the Syria conflict, the way he was in the process of withdrawing from Afghanistan. But on other issues, he's been more, more engaged. So I think I would say it's actually quite unpredictable what Trump would do were he actually to be elected in 2024. Yeah, indeed. Were he actually to be elected, what have yes. these midterm elections, in a word, done to his chances of a run? A conventional wisdom seems to be emerging that they have hurt him, but not knocked him out. A lot of the candidates that he supported in primary races underperformed. At the same time, potential rivals uh, emerging within the Republican Party, particularly the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, who had an exceptional night. But it is quite early, and the idea that someone within the Republican Party would challenge Trump for the nomination, I think, is still, what's the word, uh, up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, Trump did not have a great night. On the other hand, all, all evidence seems to indicate he is still the front runner for the Republican nomination. Good to speak to you. Always interesting to hear your thoughts. Dr. Jonathan Monson, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, where do you go if you want to discuss politics, find out the latest news, or maybe just see celebrity mishaps on the red carpet? Well, getting on for a quarter of a billion times a day, people go to Twitter for that and much more. It's the world's fourth most visited website and has become part of the fabric of daily life. Twitter is, for example, where the UK Ministry of Defence chooses to post its daily summaries of intelligence about the war in Ukraine. It's also where the royal family first announced the death of Her Majesty the Queen. But there's been worldwide outrage from some about the shakeup of Twitter by its new owner, Elon Musk. The controversy is not just about user charges and job losses or debates on free speech. The White House is looking at national security concerns because more than a third of the money comes from investors in Saudi Arabia and China. Does Twitter really matter that much? A social media site where anyone can share their thoughts 240 characters at a time. Well, Dr. Alistair Pinkerton from Royal Holloway University of London researches geopolitics and social media and has helped UK Defence understand the military uses of Twitter. It's hugely important. You know, when you think back 10, 15, 20 years, the way that things like the news agenda would have worked is that lobby journalists would have picked up particular stories that would have come from governments that would have fed into early morning radio programs and that would have then featured in the next day's newspapers. Now, Twitter has become that town square. It has become that direct conduit between governments, royal families, militaries, corporations directly into the public mind. It has sped things up to an incredible degree. It has allowed particular bits of news to proliferate. But of course, that's also led to those kind of concerns about misinformation, disinformation, and, and the verification of the news that we uh, are consuming in our everyday lives. And specifically, what is its importance or value to militaries? 
again, it's it's hugely important. It's first of all a way that militaries uh, might seek to communicate with its own personnel. It's also a way of communicating their strategic objectives, attempting to influence the minds of domestic populations, perhaps in theatres uh, of war, uh, but also letting domestic populations know about the latest happenings in other places. And you mentioned the, the daily Ukraine briefings, which have been, have been incredibly important. And to what extent do you think Twitter and the demand for quick responses has had any impact uh, on the military and the way that they operate? Well, I think it has got the potential to to change the way that the military operates. And let me give you an example. So every year I train my geopolitics students in being military leaders. I put them through a scenario exercise where we have a, a kind of an, a, an artificial invasion of a particular Danish island and Article 5 is being invoked. And I deliberately use Twitter as, uh, as a disruptive mechanism to see whether that is going to change the way they structure their broadcasts and, and, their, and their press statements. And, and it always does. Because because they, they tend to index themselves to the demands of the public and to Twitter and to the misinformation and disinformation that is being presented to them uh, on social media, uh, rather than sticking to a plan that might actually work better for them. Now, I'm not saying that the MOD would necessarily fall into that trap. They've got, you know, they've got professionals. But I, I think there is the potential to to get into a responsive mode rather than sticking to a pre-agreed plan. But Twitter is also a really important intelligence gathering device. Yeah, so our, our militaries are looking at Twitter for for information uh, themselves and, uh, and then are seeking to to verify it. So, you know, it, it is very much part of the, the military communication strategy, but also in terms of intelligence gathering as well. There are several threads to the national security concerns being raised by some in the US. One is that Twitter has become an essential part of political discourse, but we also know it's become a tool for mass disinformation that authoritarian regimes abuse to conduct information wars. Does it really help the democratic process or does it hinder it, do you think? I think it's a really difficult question to answer because it, it does a bit of both. I mean, this is the big debate that's happening in the UK and elsewhere. To what extent can... Uh, can democratic societies balance freedom of speech and the, the the liberties that are associated with the ability to f to freely communicate on platforms like Twitter, with preserving the veracity and integrity of democratic processes? When we know things like elections, which are absolutely fundamental to UK democracy, um, have been interfered with in the past by foreign agents using tools like Facebook and Twitter to share misinformation and disinformation. And of course, another key part of the national security concerns is whether Saudi Arabia and China could get undue influence over Twitter through investments based there. Is that a valid concern or a dog whistle reaction? I think the funding issue is perhaps less of an immediate concern unless that funding were directly to lead to uh, changes in corporate governance and potentially changes to things like algorithms. So, you know, if, if that funding bought the kind of influence that would allow uh, algorithms to amplify social division in particular countries, for example, or indeed to suppress problematic messaging uh, around, you know, so Saudi Arabian human rights issues, then, then I think that's where people should be very concerned because corporate governance should not allow for that kind of behaviour. Has Twitter changed the world or has it just changed how we see the world, do you think? No, I think it has changed the world. Clearly, it has also changed the way we see the world and the way that we interact with the world. I think one of the, the most profound effects that it's had is that it, it has sped up the timescales of political processes and political communication and indeed military communication as well. Now, I, I tell my students in my, in my lectures that uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it took the US government several days to make their first public statement about what was happening in the Cuban Missile Crisis. There would now be an overwhelming demand on political leaders to make a statement about an equivalent event uh, within seconds, minutes, mm -hmm. hours, and that has largely been driven by the speed that which that social media demands responses. And I think there's a fundamental question. Does that make for better decision making or poorer decision making?
And just over a decade ago, Yahoo was the world's biggest website. Now it's in obscurity and we use Google as a verb. Uh, Twitter is replaceable ultimately, isn't it? It is very much replaceable. And as it happens this morning, I have just registered for an alternative to Twitter called Mastodon, which is being talked about as uh, as the kind of the new Twitter. Just out, just out of interest, Alice, so why did you change? Well, I haven't changed. I've still got my, my Twitter account, but... Mm. Uh, you know, I, I have got concerns about the way that Twitter is is going. Um, I think that the the work that particular units within Twitter did to detoxify that environment, Mastodon promises to do the same thing in an era where Twitter seems to be going the other way. I'm not leaving Twitter yet, but there are alternatives out there, and and Mastodon is certainly one of them. Dr. Alistair Pinkerton, really good to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Finally, today, we reflect on the life and service of Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Boyce, who's died at the age of 79. A young Michael Boyce joined the Royal Navy in 1961 and over four decades rose to become Chief of the Defence Staff from 2001 until 2003. In that role, he led the UK's armed forces through the invasions of both Afghanistan and Iraq. But he was most proud of his many years serving beneath the waves as a submariner and on the 50th anniversary of the continuous at sea deterrent, he shared that pride in those who'd followed him. The guys, when they do their job, they're highly professional, they're very proud of what they do. They do it in a very unsung way, very quiet sort of way, which is our is the sort of San Mariner's ethos. But by golly, they're professional and uh, we owe them a huge thanks for what they've done for 50 years. Michael Clark, what kind of a man and leader was Admiral Lord Boyce? Yes, he was, as you say there, he was a submariner. And, you know, submariners are a bit like goalkeepers. They are a sort of an eccentric elite. He had that uh, that sort of grip, uh, intellectual grip on issues. I mean, he had, he had very distinctive eyes. And, you know, sometimes he would look in a meeting. He'd Sometimes his eyes would glint and sometimes they would twinkle um, because he'd sit and he'd listen. And then he would ask very incisive questions or make a very incisive comment. I only got to know him really after he'd retired as, as Chief of Defence Staff. But in many meetings that he was in, um, I was always struck by the fact he never tried to show off. He never tried to be the main attraction at the meeting, even though he could have been. He sat and he listened and then he came back with some very incisive ideas and thoughts. And when I was <clears throat> running Grusey and, I, you know, you'd have a meeting coming up, as you run your eye down the list, say, oh, Mike Boyce is coming. That's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. You, you, always, you always knew if he was in the room that you'd get something from him that would be a, a real addition to whatever anyone else was saying. And yet Lord Boyce was ridiculed by the US Defence Secretary in 2001 for contradicting the US claim that Afghanistan war would be over in a year. History proved him very much correct. And he clashed with his own Prime Minister and Chancellor over Iraq and funding for the forces. He was also one of the people who demanded legal advice confirming the invasion would be legal. He doesn't seem to have been afraid to tell it how he saw it. No, that's the way he was. And he didn't make himself all that popular with politicians, by and large, but he did with his own service. And he did with those of us on the outside who are in the analysis community because you knew that that you had a a, a very sharp intellect there who was um, giving you his view in a very straightforward way. And, you know, when you're the CDS, the Chief of Defence Staff, your job is to sit between the military and the politicians and to moderate one to the other. But Mike Boyce found himself in that position in 2003 of saying, I will not commit the forces unless you tell me that this invasion that Mm. you're planning is legal. You know, I will not give the order. Now, most CDSs don't find themselves in quite that position, but he was in that position. And history, I think, will be grateful to him that he stood up for the forces and said, we will not fight in an illegal war. So I want you to convince me that this is legal before I issue any orders. That's a tough thing to say to the Prime Minister, but he did. And what do you think uh, military leaders of now and the future should learn from Lord Boyce? I think they should learn exactly that point, that if it comes to the crunch, a Chief of Defence Staff has got to represent the armed forces. Military leaders have got to represent the boys and girls who will put their lives on the line. And although all senior officers need to be politically astute, but if the moment comes when they have to choose, then they have to choose to represent the forces. And I think that's what Mike Boyce did. And I think I, you know, he'll be a great loss. 
and I think I honour his memory because he was the sort of CDS that you, you write chapters about, the sort of qualities you want in a CDS, he, em he embraced them. Professor Michael Clark, thank you, and my thanks to all of our guests. That's all for now. We'll be back with another SITREP next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash SITREP, or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.